Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. My name is George Greenlee. I would like to invite you all, or welcome you all, I should say, to our latest Knowledge Series webinar. These monthly webinars are uh, aimed at providing a deeper dive into the RAIN RFID technology, its benefits, uh, and its challenges, uh, some of which we will talk to today. On the next slide, you can see that I have selected a set of webinars that we have run earlier this year. It's a subset of what we've done, but it contains information that is uh, relevant to what we're talking to today. So after this webinar, you may feel like to, it's worthwhile going back to look at these webinars to get a few extra deeper di dimensions on what we're talking about today. Uh, you can find these webinars on our website, just go to the resources uh, menu and you'll find uh, webinars in there. I would like to uh, point out that uh, this webinar is being recorded. So if you miss out on anything that's been said, you can come back in and have a look at the webinar. And you can also make uh, a link available to your colleagues and friends uh, who may find the webinar interesting. Questions, uh, if you have questions of our presenters today, please type them in the chat box and we will get to them at the end of the session. And we probably won't be able to get to all of them, uh, but uh, we'll get to the ones that we, uh, we can do. With that said, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Suzanne Gert uh, Orlowski. Uh, Suzanne is founder of For the Record. Uh, it's a DPP consultancy that is aimed at helping companies implement their DPP strategy. But today she's here in her capacity as a DPP specialist to the uh, RAIN Alliance. So I'd hand over now to Suzanne. Yes, thank you, George, for the nice introduction. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of a context of why we're sitting here together. Um, the context is the tire industry and the challenges it's being faced with regards to sustainability and circularity. And uh, the discussion you want to have is around is the sustainability and circularity and the requirements that come with it, um, is that only posing a challenge for the tire industry or may there also be opportunities for the industry and the stakeholders around them? And um, Lauri and Ricardo, our two speakers today, they will have a lively discussion about it. Um, so um, I will introduce our um, discussion guests. Uh, first is uh, Lauri Hültinen. He is um, Marketing Development Manager Automotive at Every Denison. And uh, in his 15 years of experience in the RFID business, he has supported over 100 projects uh, together with different solution partners. And on top of that um, position at Avery Dennison, he also has worked as a vice leader of the RAIN Tire Working Group. And he has also supported different industrial working groups to build RFID standards and recommendations for the global automotive industry. Uh, welcome, Lauri. It's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, and um, our second guest is uh, Riccardo Giovanotti. He is a Secretary General at the GDSO. And for those that don't know what the GDSO it is, it stands for a Global Data Service Organization for Tires and Automotive Components. Um, he has ex uh, extensive experience in the automotive industry as well and uh, also has led uh, several projects at the international level combining global and local needs. And he has supported the GTSO setup, keeping in mind continuous and sustainable development in the digital framework. And thanks to his engineering background and MBA, he has proven skills obviously to bring an industry through the upcoming transformation process that we have ahead of us. So uh, also a warm welcome to Ricardo. Great to have you here today. Thank you. And with this, I'm handing over to Lauri, who is going to pose the first questions, I assume. Lauri, it's your floor. Thanks, Susan. All right, so I think we 
just move to the next slide, please. No, okay, okay, we can we can go back. So Rain Alliance supports lots of different goods identification, and today we are focused on tires. So Ricardo is our expert. So Ricardo, tires are not digital or electric devices. So why tires are so important? Yeah, that, that's really the point, Lori. Thanks for uh, for raising it. Uh, tires are not a digital device. They're not an, even an electronic one. Uh, and in this really moment, uh, uh, every industry, every product is looking at new services, new solution around data. So at a certain point, uh, the tire industry understood the pressure in trying to create uh, that kind of uh, new ecosystem, a new approach for the tires themselves. And therefore, uh, the, the tire manufacturer decided to work together and to start talking about data for that reason, to create new services and solution. Data. So within the tire working group and also with the tire manufacturers, we have quite much focus to speaking about physical assets and, and the RFID performance, for example. But why we should speak more about the data and why it's so important for the tire industry? Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was referring to before, Laurie. Uh, so far, the tire industry was uh, very much focusing on the on the tires as a physical good, as a physical asset, focusing on uh, their own performances that are really crucial because it's uh, the only component in contact with the road in the vehicle. Uh, for those in the Nordic countries, you know that grip is something that is really crucial for you, for example. But even beyond that, as I was saying, uh, uh, there are just... Uh, tires, they are thrown on the market. So, uh, you know, the tire identity, for example, is something that is uh, uh, really crucial in creating new services, new solution. And everything was still uh, somehow um, relaying on, uh, you know, manual operation, visual inspection, uh, manual, uh, you know, writing. So it was really a turning point for the tire industry. And everyone agreed that we should start in, you know, putting together the different pieces of the puzzle, starting from the tire identity. So looking at a possible serialization, not only anymore the stock keeping unit or let's say product line, but looking at possibility in data carriers, electronic devices that could land uh, in a, in a new environment, as I was saying before, not only anymore the tire is a physical good, looking at performances, but beyond that, starting from the identification. All right, that, that's very interesting. And, and if we a little bit move back to the GDSO. So Ricardo, could you please tell them what, what is GDSO? Who are the members? And are these, you, you mentioned the kind of unique identifiers. Are these mentions of members also committed to place the unique identifiers for their tires in the future. Thanks for the question, Lori. So GDSO is an international non-for-profit organization. It means it means it's a, an industry organization uh, focusing on creating standards around data and also in standardizing the services to simplify data sharing across different stakeholders. And, you know, uh, we were established in the uh, beginning of 2022, so we are almost rookies, but the momentum is really the right one. We are creating a clear and great uh, critical mass around uh, uh, these activities, and we have already 12 time manufacturers uh, joining uh, uh, GDSO uh, with a global footprint, and all of them are committed to implement this kind of data sharing, databases. Indeed, we talk about tire manufacturers, but from a GDSO perspective, there are more and most important data providers. For sure, as I was saying before, they are still producing tires. That's an asset. But from a GDSO perspective, they are considered data providers. And for sure, they, all of them are in a kind of a scaling up approach in implementing electronic identifiers, in implementing the serialization, and in implementing new services and solutions. So I would say that we are at the beginning, but the hype, the interest is pretty high. And we are seeing every every year and new members joining GDSO, confirming that we are going the right direction, but also every week, every month, uh, interesting exchanges with a very complex environment of different stakeholders along the tire value chain and with new tire manufacturers more and more interested to, to start that kind of digital journey altogether, moving from just operation to digitalization. 
the question which I have heard a couple of times asked from from you in, in the earlier events and is, is related to data and, and the databases. So could you clarify, is GDSO a joint database or what, what is the GDSO role there between the databases? That, that, that's really an important question. Thanks, Lori. So let me clarify, first of all, what GDSO is not. Then I will ask uh, the support of RAIN to, to display the, the famous graph that we've got. So GDSO is not a central database and GDSO is not a data broker. That's really fundamental. Uh, maybe, Elizabeth, you can help me in uh, sharing the, the spider, the, the famous graph. So mainly, GDSO is a, is a service provider. So we focus our attention in standardizing data. And on the screen, you may see the tire information service, what we call the TIS. Um, the TIS is mainly um, a data space with a connector connecting uh, different users with different stakeholders. As you may see on the bottom left side, we talk about the serialization, the tire identity that is captured by a user. This user uh, is using our APIs, so our, uh, uh, let's say, standards in uh, capturing uh, the, in, sorry, in creating the queries, uh, uh, in making the question. And GDSO is the service provider. So as you may see in the block number three and four, is the governance body that is uh, authenticating the user, is resolving uh, that kind of uh, query saying, okay, this tire with a weird identity made uh, of a possible alphanumeric code means you have to go to the tire company B, that is the box on the right side. And there, let's say, based on this standardized discussion and, and, and uh, technology, the user may knock at the door of the tire company, and based on the B2B agreement uh, between the user and the tire company, there is an authorization step. So the tech company is providing back the data to the user. What does it mean? It means, as I was saying before, the system is based on a clear governance that is ruled by GDSO in a standardized way with the proper terms of use for users and data providers, so the tech companies, but it's also based on a decentralized database approach. So the data are stored in the tech companies. GDSO has no visibility of the kind of query, the kind of answer, and the kind of agreement, the business agreement between the user and the tech company. So let's say in a simple way, it's like if GDSO is a traffic ruler saying, if you want to go in the right direction, no, Elizabeth, go back, please. If you need for some information, you have just to, to follow the right, the, the right path. You don't need to do anything more. And that's um, what then uh, is also the, the strength because with only one platform, only one standardized solution, no matter the user, no matter the tire company, everything can be simplified. And as you may see at the very top of this, uh, of the, of this slide, GDSO is technology agnostic. So the, maybe I can anticipate another question, Lori, uh, also running from, from others. So why GDSO is here today? Because we are technology agnostic, but we also understood that for some use cases, uh, we have to go in detail for some uh, specific data carriers. And one of those is, uh, is the RFID. But in general, and um, let's say more at a high level, all the GDSO services are based on the serialized SGT96 code for every single tile. Thanks, Ricardo. Very, very nice. I, I really like this slide. The question today is, is that, that you mentioned that, that GDSO, it was created just a couple of years ago. So looking at the picture here and, and your answer that, that GDSO is a service provider, what is this services? What, what is the maternity level of GDSO services today? Yeah. The, the... From a service provider point of view, that's really an important point. Uh, you know, very often we see um, organization talking about a global footprint uh, and a nice data spaces and connector on PowerPoint. The good news is that GDSO is live. I mean, uh, we are even beyond the PowerPoint. So the system that you see on the screen uh, is in production. Uh, so the tire information service is already implemented by a number of different stakeholders, by the tire manufacturer themselves, by some distributors, by some um, vehicle manufacturers. 
uh, even by some uh, uh, other stakeholders along the entire value chain. So that, that's really important. As I was saying, we are in a kind of a scanning up uh, stage. It means that we are already in place, we are live, we are in production, we are looking for further extending both the adoption by different tire manufacturers and the implementation by different uh, uh, stakeholders all around the world. Because again, uh, the mantra, I guess, uh, in our discussion is always to be global, no matter the region, because as soon as we talk about data uh, in GDSO, in RAIN, uh, in GS1, in many other, let's say, uh, uh, places, uh, we have to, to talk about a global landscape. Good. So, so today's kind of webinar topic and, and the title is related to sustainability and circularity. So when we think about the GDSO and tire information services, how does kind of, um, are those ready to support kind of future requirements for the sustainability and circularity and, and kind of the challenges which those are bringing for the industry? That, that's really the, the turning point in our discussion, Lori. Um, the, this, the graph that you see on this screen is the one that we decided to introduce as an approach, as a service, as I was saying before, to elevate the discussion and the tire industry itself from just manufacturing to a service solution and digitalization uh, journey. But it's not enough. Because this one is really just the first step. It means that in one of the use cases that this star information service may solve is the identification of a good. But then this system, and that's the weak point, we know it very well, is not able to collect additional information while tires are further evolving, while tires are along their life and moving from one stakeholder to the other. So that was really the first step. And uh, if we move to the next slide, you may see a, a more complex environment than, than what I was saying before. So yeah, this is line number five. Um, you know, the, the road for the tire journey is very complex. It's not just within the tire manufacturer's um, uh, premises. It's not just for uh, vehicle manufacturers, but tires may evolve during their life. They can be retreaded. That means rebuilt because the, the tires can be rebuilt uh, when they re reach uh, the minimum tread depth. Uh, but also they can be subject of uh, additional evaluation while their life up to the very end of life. So the first challenge that we got within the industry was to try to understand in a variety of different data carriers that can be fed with a, a serialized code, what could be the one uh, serving a, a cradle to grave use case. We made our technical assessment and with today technology, today availability and standardization, we understood that the only data carrier that may cover a cradle to grave use case for the tires is the embedded RFID. So that was already a first pillar that along with the SGT-96 uh, told us, okay, we may have a way forward, but then how to enable the capability of the service itself to start keeping and recording all this kind of information along the tire value chain. So we are now in the process to develop a new connector. Again, GDSO is a data space. Uh, where different players may have a kind of super rights. And they will start pushing back the information to the regional tire manufacturer about what is happening to the tire. So that that database can be updated, for example, with the information that the tire was retreaded and new features were added. Because that's the point. The tire can evolve during its life, can even change uh, some, let's say, identity but starting from the SGT-96, we expect to be able to build on the original identity all the number of different information up to the end of life. And as you may see, this may open a number of multiple use cases. They could be for sustainability, because then the tire manufacturer will be able to collect all the different steps and create an assessment on that, on that product, but also in terms of circularity, because at the very end of life, 
then that information about that tire can be collected and all the different components can be um, uh, recycled in the proper manner. So we are working in creating a new solution, a new service, a new connector uh, that is called the tire lifecycle data service for which all these kind of sustainability and circularity use cases uh, will be enabled. All right, that, that's very interesting. And, and that's maybe kind of building the bridge also towards the digital product passport. So, so if we think about that, I think there's a regulatory kind of a self-defined um, the delegate act in next year in 2025 already. So has GDSO prepared any technical assessment about the possible solutions for DPP implementation? So I think this is moving to that direction now. Yeah, uh, as I was saying, um, the DPP is, um, I, I'm pretty sure that Susan will help us to, to dive in. Um, is a complex uh, uh, dossier. I mean, it's a chapter of a complex dossier uh, that in Europe will be managed by ETRMA, so the European Tire and Rubber Manufacturer Association, from a, a regulatory angle. From technical standpoint, uh, we were trying to better understand what's the different pillars to make it real. And, you know, as I was saying before, we are convinced as a technical organization that serialization is the right way. Serialization means that we expect every single tire to be coded with an SGT96. And in terms of data carriers, as this, the, the slide is still on the screen, uh, the position is simple. We think that a cradle to grave use case, like the one that you mentioned, the DPP, that is just one among many others, can be enabled just through um, an embedded RFID, a standardized and accessible uh, data carrier for the tire industry. Because there are a, a set of four ISO standards, for example, that were developed by the, the tire industry uh, for um, the implementation of the RFID. But not only, as I was mentioning, uh, uh, we need a platform. And we are convinced that the new connector that we are developing will be the one supporting the data sharing. So it's a, a kind of, a, let's say, lookup method. Uh, different stakeholders, different players uh, uh, along the value chain will have to look up at the identity, will have to be in the position to possibly feed the, the original time manufacturer with new information. And that's the, the connector that we are developing based on a data space approach. So the three pillars according to GDSO, as far as the technical discussion is concerned, is based on serialization, embedded RFID, and the, and the new platform that we are developing, the TLDS. But for sure, you know, the, the, the discussion is much more complex and uh, it's up to ETRMA and, uh, and you know, the, the guys in the, in the European Commission and all the many other stakeholders involved to create uh, what will be then the routes uh, for the implementation and the content as well. Excellent. Thanks, Ricardo. That sounds very, very interesting. And I think the DPP is so hot topic now. So I, I think it's the time to take Susan and, and kind of Susan will explain a bit more about the DPP and status today. Yes, I will. And thank you, Lauri and Ricardo, for the good discussion uh, and the groundwork uh, for uh, what I want to share with you. And uh, I'm very glad that the tire industry has already come together in this consortium the, or the industry initiatives that GDS Own has already started with um, all the you know technical specifications that have just been introduced. Um, because we will have a lot of use cases, as you said, with regards to sustainability and the digital product passport is probably one of the pressing topics that are coming towards the tire industry. So let me quickly explain um, just some high level information about the digital product passport. Um, what is it? Um, the digital product passport is a digital verifiable information about a product, uh, in that case, a tire, and it shall help um, to improve the product's circularity using R strategies. So R strategies, everything that starts with an R, such as reuse, repair, recycle, retread uh, in, in the case of tires. Um, and this is therefore, um, the DPP is supposed to be a vehicle 
to enable the circular economy and also new circular business models, maybe improve the retreading of tires and uh, yeah, reuse of the material, recycling the material. Um, it is also a means to show manufacturing circumstances to the customer who can then make informed choices about the product. Um, for example, where you can see, you know, have all child labor um, or human rights um, circumstances meet the regulatory requirements. And if you have uh, that insight as a customer, you can make better choices when purchasing a product. Um, it sh shall also help the authorities to uh, verify the compliance with legal obligations. Um, and it is mandatory very soon for batteries in 2027 to comply uh, to the EU regulation to actually put products on the market. Um, I already mentioned the battery regulation, but also the Eco Design for Sustainable Products regulation, short ESBR, that includes um, a several list of um, products that I will show now, but also there are more and more regulations are pointing to the digital product passport and are using it um, for compliance reasons. And um, tires is one of the prioritized products under the ESPR, which is on the next slide. Um, here are the categories um, that have been shortlisted of the ESPR and tires is um, at, um, you know, the shortlisted um, list of products. So this will definitely come for, for tires. And with regards to the timeline, and we can already move to the next uh, slide, um, uh, it's the case that um, at some point in, um, so we, at the moment uh, we are in 2024, the ESPR is ratified, and we're currently defining the technical standards for the DPP framework and system in the JTC 24, which has to be finalized by the end of 2026, uh, by the end of 2025, sorry, um, where I guess Ricardo uh, also has to look at, you know, or maybe even influence uh, the technical standards that are being defined there to make sure that the tire industry is represented nicely. Um, so that's happening, the standardization work is happening and on the legal work, there will be um, delegated acts on each of the product categories that we've just seen where tires is one and those delegated acts will come out in 2025. And then we see uh, here in 2028 um, that the DPP for the first ESBR products become mandatory the first DPP that becomes mandatory is the one for batteries in February 2027. So kind of that's the timeline um, that is relevant for tires. Um, and with that, just, just I wanted to give a background um, of um, yeah, and the, or just a high level overview of what's, what's happening for digital product passport. Um, and it is, 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 as it was mentioned before, it's just one um, use case for the data exchange in the dire industry, but we have more use cases to come and maybe we can jump to that slide, which is, I think, maybe the next one. Uh, yeah, here. So we just mentioned the digital product passport, but there's other regulations that also will mandate the data exchange in the tire industry. For example, the deforestation regulation um, where you know, rubber trees um, uh, maybe are grown um, to, to gain the rubber and the due diligence statements around that. Um, there is uh, for a couple of regulations, the, um, a, a proper tire identification and record keeping is required uh, in the US, there is the extended producer responsibility um, that um, companies have to comply to. Then there is quite some requirements of customs. Um, for example, the CBAM um, regulation, the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanisms of the European Commission, um, or the European Union, uh, the global business identifier, um, which also looks at um, this where you know data exchange is needed to show the compliance to that regulations. Um, another application area might be the non-dot process, 
um, in the US where um, there is a dot symbol on all the tires that comply to US regulations. And if you don't have that dot, then you have to actually trace those tires and make sure that they're destroyed or no longer in the US at some point. And then uh, last but not least, um, the materials compositions um, where we have the requirements to show or avoid a certain substances of very high concern, for example, in the REACH requirement um, and other requirements. So there's a list, it's probably not a complete list, but it already shows you that a lot of regulations um, need data to improve the sustainability of products in, in general, but tires um, specifically, um, which will come and which will need the, the data exchange that we have just discussed. Um, and with this, maybe um, we can jump back to one slide um, where we wanted to also share the news with regards to um, in the DPP environment, um, where there's a requirement to read um, the data carrier um, with mobile devices. And here we have, I guess, very brand news that Qualcomm has announced um, that um, so Qualcomm is a provider of chi chipsets for mobile phones of various manufacturers. So Google used them and Samsung and other um, mobile, uh, mobile phone producers. They have added functionality to the chips to allow um, RAIN RFID re reading from mobile devices. So we will be, uh, be seeing those in mobile phones um, in the next quarters, which will also allow um, to access that information uh, easier for consumers, uh, for people in all kinds of different positions in the B2B environment, um, in the B2C environment and so forth to have access to that information that we've been talking about. So I think um, that's important news for the industry. And with this, uh, I want to jump to the um, slide after this one exactly, um, just as a short summary for what you've seen so far until, and after that we go into the Q&A session. Um, first of all, we had the great introduction of data uh, sharing and why it's crucial for sustainability and how this is um, achieved at the moment and that standardization is already ongoing in the tire industry. Um, we showed kind of one of the big application areas, which is the digital product passport, which is coming up um, to use this data. And um, I also uh, would like to point you to our event in Florence, the Rain in Action workshop. And if you're not registered today and you want to come to Florence in September, please use the QR code and register today because at that event, we will go into more depth of the digital product pass, but we have a full workshop there to um, discuss requirements um, from the tire industry, um, to discuss you know, use cases and to have many, many more insights. We have the European Commission there um, and a lot of companies involved, companies in the entire industry coming together, discussing uh, the digital product passport, its requirement and how we can comply to it. So please feel invited to join us in Florence. And I think with that, um, I would like to hand over to George uh, and thank you everyone uh, for the input so far. And I hope we have some um, questions coming up from our audience. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, we've had one question, which I've dealt with here. It's um, an interesting question concerning the collection of data around uh, recovered car carbon black and sharing that data within the industry. I think it's a very specific question for this particular webinar. So I've uh, said to the person who's requested it that we'll connect them with a person who can, can provide some information on that. So uh, I would take this time now to ask anyone who's uh, has a question to please type it in the Q&A session and we see if we can uh, get a discussion going here. Yeah, maybe to break the ice a little bit, um, I have prepared a question uh, maybe to Ricardo or, or a comment. Um, I heard you talking about additional data that comes, that has to be amended or added to the, yeah, 
information of attire. Um, and that's also a requirement for the digital product pass. But have you already experienced or you know worked with some technical ideas how to do that? Um, maybe something that you can. Yeah, thanks a lot, Susan. So yeah. first of all, let's say content-wise, uh, let me remark uh, once again, uh, the regulatory dossier is on uh, ETRMA, so the Trade Association in Europe. From a GDSO perspective, uh, let's say in a simple way, we don't care about the content. We will pave the road uh, about the how, how to do that. So we are developing uh, uh, user stories, uh, trying to explain how to achieve the goal. So um, we are strongly believing that the goal can be achieved uh, by implementing a, a data space approach with different players having different rights and so developing uh, with some, let's say, uh, application programming interface, the proper way to exchange data. And therefore seeing GDSO having a kind of a double role. From one side being the governance body, uh, so the one setting the rules, the standards, how to code the, the, the different uh, information, uh, but also a kind of a clearing house. The one ensuring that the data are flowing in the right way that the players have got the rights to do that so that then the time manufacturers may, may also digest uh, this kind of uh, declaration coming from uh, the different players. So everything should be based on, uh, as I was saying, on a data space approach, having GDSO at the center as a governance body, but also as a kind of, uh, let's say, uh, trusted party in ensuring that the data transfer is the right one. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ricardo, um, do we have other questions in the chat? Yeah, I have one here. I'm just reading it out live. Um, it says, uh, for the tire retreaders, is one of the goals to track the number of times a tire casing has been retreaded and flag those casings that have been retreaded too many times? It's a very Thanks specific so question, I understand. Yeah. Thanks, George. So um, I didn't deep dive on the current status of standardized information on the new one that we are expecting. But for sure, we made a one-to-one -one interview with many stakeholders, retraders, end of light tire companies, also uh, many others. And it was clear that uh, as soon as we talk about tires and their identity, the physical asset itself is playing a role. So how to add value to the physical asset? Exactly uh, based on the question that we received in tracing if the tire was already retreaded or not. You know, from a retreader perspective, it may have a different value if it is a just brand new tire that was uh, reaching the minimum level of thread depth, or if it was already retreaded three times and it got one million kilometers uh, life. So we are trying to collect all that kind of information that may bring value to the asset, but also optimizing and speeding up the internal processes for every stakeholder, retreaders and the black tires, so that digitalization may really bring uh, an additional value for all of them. Thank you. Um, I'm just reading this one. Okay, so the next question is, uh, hello, the first product to have mandatory DPP is the batteries due to the EV growth. Um, and then the tires will be also be DPP mandatory around 2028 with the first ESR, ESPR products. Okay, that's a statement. I thought it was going to be a question mark. No, I think it's a question. I think will the DPP for, for tires will also be mandatory mid-2028. Right, okay. So um, if we can go to slide eight and show the timeline again, um, I can share a little bit of insights additionally to just the timeline data. Um, and there you can see that at the beginning of 2025, um, there is an adoption of the, uh, no, no, uh, the timeline. Uh, yeah, this one. Thank you. Um, at the beginning of 2025, there is the adoption of the ESPR work plan. That means that the list of products that I just showed um, might be, you know, changed or be, uh, did get a priority order or the like. Um, and once this is out, we will know more which delegated acts will come out uh, for which product group. So for each of the products that you saw, each product group, a delegated act under ESPR will be issued. And the first two ones will be um, textiles and steel. Um, so we expect them very soon. 
Um, and then you can, you know, calculate maybe uh, two and a half, three years later, um, the DPPs for that product category will become mandatory. So depending on how the work plan looks like, we have a better idea at the beginning of next year when exactly DPPs for tires become mandatory. So stay tuned uh, with the information that comes from RAIN um, to get that, uh, that info soon. Okay. Uh, so the next question is, does GDSO consider to open data access to the public as possibly suggested by some DPP requirements? And I guess it's still to me, yes. Um, yes. So thanks, Philippe, for the question. Um, let's say, as I was explaining before, um, short answer is yes. Long answer is a bit more articulated. Let, let me explain. So uh, GDSO, let's remind what Lori was saying before. Um, the tire industry is not uh, really dealing with electronic and digital devices. So up to now, GDSO was focusing uh, on the B2B level. That means enabling tire electronic identity and management in the B2B environment. But for sure, as I was mentioning before, uh, it will be easier to tackle uh, the different challenges in uh, managing the, the dossier uh, of the ESPR and the DPP requirements. GDSO is open to implement uh, whatever is needed. For sure, then it's more on RAIN to understand, for example, how to enable the, cost, the consumer, the end user, in scanning a tire. But we learned from Suzanne that good news are popping up, that now also for consumer technologies uh, it will be available. So let's say from a GDSO perspective, again, it doesn't matter. Maybe the discussion is more on the regulatory dossier. Is it really worth to provide detailed information on that very specific tire, or it's more on you know product line level to allow the consumer to have an informed choice uh, when at the point of sale or for any other reason. But again, that, that will be topic a topic for the delegated act uh, from a GDSO perspective. As soon as we have the technology and we have the right, uh, let's say, guideline and request from uh, ETRMA and the commission, uh, everything is possible. That is all the questions for the moment. Yeah, any more questions from the audience? I think there's one more. Um, the EU regulation on food are on standby. Um, so the, there's a fourth question that. came in. Okay, let me find it. Ah, sorry, okay. So, uh, as I understand it, the EU regulations on food are on standby, waiting for the first experiences with DPP on other products. Is that correct? And what food products can be expected to be the first under DPP? I guess that's probably for you, uh, Susan. Yeah, I can take that. Um, so, the, the product categories under ESPR um, are on the one slide that we showed. And food and pharmacy is excluded from those products. So they're not regulated under ESPR. And the reason uh, why that is, is that there are other regulations that look after food and pharmacy. So you have this food, uh, a farm to fork initiative for food, um, and they have different regulations. It's possible that they wait for DPP experiences. Um, but they won't be regulated under ESPR. They will be regulated under a different regulation, which would I, which I don't know by heart, to be honest. Uh, I'm not a specialist in uh, farm to fork, um, but hopefully the technology will be will be the same. Um, as you know, some ingredients for food might also end up in in other products. Um, um, and also, you know, pharmacy is the same. Um, the idea is that there will be an overarching DPP system um, that is the same independent of the product category so that especially for raw material providers, they don't have to serve so many different, different systems. So one system for tires, another system uh, for textiles and then a third system for batteries. The idea is that if you are an aluminium provider and your product is in, you know, in paints and toys and and um, yeah, a lot of a lot of different products, then you should only serve one system um, and those sh they should be interoperable. So um, that's all I can say um, as I'm not an expert in the in the food area. Okay, the fifth question is now in. Um, 
and it's for you again, Suzanne. Could you repeat who is coming with Rain RFID chip in mobile handheld? I didn't catch the name very well. You're on the Yeah, so right? it's Qualcomm. Qualcomm is coming um, with um, Rain RFID um, technology in the chip. And while maybe uh, um, another question comes up, I will look for the link of the press release and share it in the chat. So bear with me one second, please. Okay. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Yeah, maybe I can I can raise a, a kind of a rhetoric question to Suzanne so that we can stress again uh, the importance of what we are doing. Uh, how do you see the timeline for uh, Sense Senelec uh, and for all the different industries, including the tire industry, in being prepared for the DPP? Because we saw also in your timeline that the time is very stringent. And, and the tire industry is an example. We do not have an electronic device. We do not have... Uh, uh, today, a large deployment of uh, electronic uh, identification. What's, according to you, the major challenge uh, occurring in, uh, in Sense Senelec or in other rooms uh, today? Um, I guess the biggest challenge of Sense Senelec JTC24 is the short timeline. Uh, the timeline is end of 2025. And we have a couple of working groups there um, on identification, data carrier, security, exchange protocols. Um, and I guess the short timeline uh, is, is the biggest challenge. Um, what I like about the work and how it's done at the moment is that uh, the European Commission gave us the instruction to be as open and exclusive, inclusive as possible. Um, so that we should take uh, on board um, technologies that are currently used in the industry um, to make sure that um, all industries um, can reuse technologies that they're using today also to minimize the costs of implementing the DPP. So they want that technology is being reused and the JTC24 is creating the menu for the delegated acts. So whatever we define in JTC24, where I'm also a member in, in two working groups, um, is something, um, is a list of standards that can then be used for the delegated acts. And in the tire delegated acts, they, there maybe might be stated, okay, use this data carrier and uh, use this identifier and use this lookup mechanism to make it, to narrow it down. But at the moment, you know, we will have, we will define a bouquet of existing standards to be inclusive as possible. And in the meantime, I have shared the link um, to the press release, which, um, which yeah, will, I guess, foster some innovation in the space, mobile space, RFID space, product information uh, space. Uh, I think this is very exciting times. Suzanne, I'm going to put you on the spot again, and, and um, maybe you can uh, give us uh, a little bit of an elaboration on uh, Surpass 2 and the demonstration of capabilities and possibilities in the tire uh, uh, industry. What's happening there? Yeah, the good question. I talked with Caroline Benny today, who is leading Surpass 2 from COA. Um, the research, the French Research, research Institute. Um, all I can say is that there is um, there are 13 pilots in Surpass 2. Uh, at least one of the pilots is with tires led by Michelin. And if you look at the Surpass 2 website, um, you will already find some videos of how Michelin is uh, using RFID as a data carrier and what they want to do with it. Um, but that's about all I can say at the moment um, towards towards yeah um, surpass two. They're looking into making thirteen pilots interoperable with each other, which I think is kind of the the biggest challenge of that project. And it should feed the European Commission with the challenges um, that um, can be faced with you know providing an interoperable system to the industry. Okay, uh, some more questions have come in. This is beginning to get good. Um, from the 
from the perspective of data carrier, what is the most strongest competitor to, competitor of RAIN RFID? Uh, and it says, what do you think here? But I'm going to reinterpret that to say what, what makes RAIN RFID the, the special carrier. And that's probably open to, to you, Ricardo, I guess. I would say maybe more on the... On uh, Lori or uh, other technical guys, as I was saying, GDSO made a technical assessment on um, on different data carriers. So I can provide the, the first hook in answering uh, why an embedded RFID for tires, but then I leave the floor to the others. So uh, as I was saying, um, we understood for uh, cradle to grave use cases, we needed something that should be long lasting, accessible, standardized, and somehow not to be counterfeited. I mean, we were looking for a serialized uh, implementation of the identity that should be permalocked. And if you build on all this kind of description, we lend to an embedded RFID. That is uh, for the tire industry, standardized, accessible, and permalocked. And it allows to, uh, to be coded with a serialized approach. Then uh, for the remaining part on uh, why uh, the, the rain strength uh, may apply even to other products, or let's say what are the strength of the rain technology, I will leave the floor to, to the others. Um, yeah, I can share a little bit and, and maybe follow um, Ricardo's way of answering this. Um, let's look at the advantages that uh, RFID can provide as a data carrier. Um, uh, RFID tags are the only tags that would survive the life of a tire to stay with the discussion. Um, they, you know, they are resistant of environmental impacts. Um, they have a long livity, so the duration um, um, that an RFID tag as data carrier needs to survive is, is probably the best one under all the data carriers that you have, and it, which, which is extremely important for the main reason of the DPP, which is you know recycling, retreading, reuse. So it, it doesn't help if you have a data carrier at the beginning um, that maybe allows the customer to make a good choice, but then is no longer available and no longer readable at the end of the life where you need to go to the recycling use case, reuse, you know, retread use cases. So I think. Here, um, that's a very um, uh, strong, a good strength of the RAIN RFID carrier. Also, um, the distance reading and the mass reading. So you can you can read RFID text from from a distance. Um, you can read a lot of RAIN RFID da data carriers um, at the same time, uh, which makes it a lot of a very efficient. Think of sorting processes. Um, where RAIN RFID, you know, you can probably read thousand um, texts at the same time, which makes sorting efficient and therefore also makes recycling a business model. If it takes too long to read a tag and then to decide if this can be recycled, uh, if this can be reused or recycled, then maybe the process might not be efficient. Um, so that those are probably uh, ones of the, the big advantages of uh, what you have um, when using a RAIN RFID as a data carrier. George, you are on mute. Sorry. Uh, one last call for questions. We're just coming up to the top of the hour. Uh, give a second or two. Okay, I think we're done. Uh, so it just remains for me to thank Dr. Susan Gorsalowski, Ricardo and uh, Laurie, and the organizer who's behind the scenes here, Elizabeth, who's put in a lot of work to make this day happen as well. So thank you all. And uh, please stay tuned people for the next uh, knowledge series webinar, which will be sometime next month. Okay, thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Laurie. And Bye -bye. see you in Florence. Yes, yeah, see you in Florence. Bye.